Beloved, today we are doing part four of the series, The Foolishness of God, and trying to understand how we can actualize great financial exploits using divine wisdom, which is part of our theme this year, the year of great exploits through uh, divine exploits, divine uh, wisdom. Now, um, the reason why we have to learn what I'm showing you and the biblical character that we are modeling today and over the past three ses or four sessions is Abraham. Can the, maybe I can you show them that image of Abraham, the great patriarch. He's the one we are modeling today, Abraham, the great patriarch. Now, you may be asking yourself the question, why must we really study Abraham's pathway? Why must we study his pathway? What we are trying to do is, I'm trying to get us to have a blueprint of what it takes to accomplish great financial exploits. We're looking for the blueprint, much like if you see a beautiful building in downtown LA, do you know that that building can be replicated somewhere else, like in Lagos? Do you know that? Okay. For it to be replicated, what, does, what do the builders need? They just need the architectural drawing. They just need the blueprint. And they can replicate it with resources, obviously. They can replicate that same building exactly. And you might go and watch. You think that they actually literally carry that building from downtown LA to Lagos. So when we are teaching about the biblical pathways to great financial exploits, we're picking a model, somebody, Abraham, who depicted great financial exploits. And his financial, his wealth, Abraham's wealth, was, didn't it end with him. His son Isaac wasn't a poor man. His grandson Jacob wasn't a poor man. And you can name his generations and his generations. To the extent that the Bible tells us that if we are going to be very successful now that we are in Christ, if we're going to be successful, it's going to be because of Abraham. That's what Galatians tell us, isn't it? He said, if, if you be Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs unto the promise, right? So you now have, we have the benefit. Abraham's wealth or pathway was replicated. It went through Isaac, he went through Jacob, and it can be taken today. So that's why we need to understand the blueprint. We need to understand the blueprint. Because it's like the architect, like the builder, you need the blueprint. If you have the blueprint, you can build. You can do the same thing. Hallelujah. So I, I need to, if the Spirit of God is always telling me, after I spend time praying and writing the message, I need to also ask the Spirit of God to tell me how to communicate it, how to communicate it. And the how is usually the things that I bring before I go to the message itself. They are because some roadblocks, they, I need to remove some roadblocks. For example, there'll be some obstruction. Some of you may be tempted to go to the restaurant, you know, when there's a key moment in this service, that's when some of you are tempted, you become very thirsty. As if, if, you, if you don't go drink water now, you're going to die. You know, going to, the enemy of your soul is going to make sure that you leave. You don't listen to the key moment. So please, do not be unaware of your strategies. If you need to silence your phone, because as you're watching on it, a message is going to come that will distract you. Just so you are aware that the enemy of your soul, he has a lot of strategies. And we are told not to be unaware of his strategies. Please, please. For the moment that you have here, you've already done a lot. You, 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 you got yourself up from your home. Some of you drove very long miles to be here. Why are you going to waste any moment? Why on earth? Is that really your plan that you plan to waste a moment? No, you didn't. But I'm telling you the things that can happen. Stop it. Stop it. I bind every spirit of, every spirit of distraction inside the sanctuary and also to you online where you are right now and there's a television on put on that put up that television and listen to what it is very important for you if you decide to listen to this why are you also listening to, to what is going on there you can always replay that television show and watch it after pay attention 
pay attention. Pay attention. I'm about to give you a blueprint from Abraham. And I've used that blueprint. That's why I'm qualified to teach. I've used that blueprint because no, many of you don't know me. My mother-in-law sitting here knows me. He knows me better than anybody else. My dad was a poor man. Didn't even have a bicycle. He didn't build a house. He couldn't send me to the great schools. I went to public schools in Africa. I didn't have a, a complete attire as a student. I had a pair of sandals that was under, oversized. A, only one pair of sandals. My dad went and bought it without my knowledge, and it was oversized, and I was condemned to wear it. Some village kid, where he is right now, owning a million-dollar home in Orange County, you must be kidding. I know all the people who grew up with me. They are nowhere to be found. So I have the credentials to show you this because I was picked from rocks to where I am. I'm not the multi-millionaires in, in, in the Hollywood. That's not what I'm talking about. But what I have, I can go to bed and sleep. Some of them need some drugs, some medication before they can sleep. I don't need that. If I need to stay longer in sleep, I'd act some PM dose. But it's not necessary. No, I have to be all full in full disclosure with all of you. Hallelujah. Yes, because sometimes, how many of you know that my time is so short, so if I need to be in bed for five hours so that I can be strong this morning, I need to knock myself up also with PM. But it's not uh, the type that they are taking. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Maybe I'm giving somebody wisdom. You don't know. Sometimes when we share our wounds, it's sometimes so that somebody might learn. You are there. The enemy has lied to you that if you drink those things, they are not bad. They are terribly bad. But let's ask ourselves the question. I'm an economist. There's cost and benefit. What's the, the overall effect, the side effect of you taking the PM version of allergy or whatever to help you stay in bed? What is the cost compared to your strength that you're going to have in the morning and clarity of mind and all of that? What is that? Does that compare? So why are you listening to lies from the enemy that when because, of course, you might become addicted to it. Doctors are, are telling us here, right? Doctors are, the, hallelujah. So let me stay in my lane, please. Uh, I'm not there. If you need that advice, go talk to the doctors and the people who are here. I'm out of that, okay? Hallelujah. <laughs> I hope you enjoy this message because it's very long. It is very long, the message today. No, because if you, until you accept that, then you're going to follow with me. I, I don't want to play tricks with you. And, you know, and so you just know in advance that I'm going to preach for about an hour. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to preach for an hour today. You know, so uh, just so you know, I'm not, yeah, in all full disclosure, I'm going to preach for an hour today. This particular message is important that I go slowly. That's why it will take an hour. And I've been rushing the thing, and the Lord has been dealing with me, so I better start doing what he asked me to do. So today is going for a long time. All right. That's in his, in his toolbox. What are the things that are part of the blueprint for great financial exploit that we learn from Abraham? There are three of them. Number one, secret. Secret of what? Obedience. Media, are you working with me? Because they have to see and hear and talk also. They, you will see, you, you see, you will hear and you will talk. So that you are, you, are, you are very engaged. The first secret we learned from Abraham in that toolbox that he had is that there is obedience. Obedience to instruction, spiritual instruction. And we see that that obedience shortens or catalyzes divine provision. Since we're talking about financial exploit, right? Having money. Oh, how many people want to, I'm talking about you actually getting wealth, not just money, because you can get money and you're not worthy. You, you know, you know, when you are worthy, you are not in debt. You can have money, but you are in debt. <laughs> Hallelujah. So when you are worthy, you have money, but you are not in debt. So when I'm talking about financial exploits and wealth exploits, the first instruction was Secret we learn from Abraham is obedience to spiritual instruction. Because obedience to instruction, instru instructions fast tracks you, gets you. So if, if you were to get there in five years, you get there in one year or in several months. Hallelujah. Obedience fast tracks your arrival. Hallelujah. You see that? Then number two, what was the secret, second secret we learn? The secret of tithing to God. 
And we know that Abraham tied it to God for two reasons, actually. And the first one was that he wanted to recognize that the source of his blessings was God. And that's why when that pagan king came to see him, the king of Sodom, came to see him and was telling, hey, Abraham, look, just give me only my people you took, okay? Keep the money. Keep, the, keep all the animals and all the work. He said, mm, I know you, I know you. You're going to come back and say you made me rich. I know the one who made me rich. And, and to firm, to anchor that one, he gave a tithe to the Lord. So the, Abraham was recognizing that the source of all blessings is God. And that they come through men, through human beings to get to you. And we also know that the source of all evil and all the trouble, Satan and evil, I mean evil comes from Satan, and he also goes to women to get to men. No, sorry, women, please. I know we live in a gender-free society. I, I want to train myself to talk about human beings, but, uh, you know, men keep coming in. No, so don't, don't be offended at all. We're not talking about men. In the Bible, when you hear men, they're talking about human beings. But even though that society was very chauvinistic, actually, you know, so, uh, but, I, I, <laughs> yeah, but I want to be clear that when, when you hear the word men come from our, I'm talking about human beings, but the Holy Spirit will help me to talk about human beings, not men. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> okay. The, and the second reason why Abraham gave the tithe was his own part of his training a guy who came from an idolatry, from the wash, a nation where they were worshipping idols. He realized that the only way he's going to defeat idolatry in his life was to be tied into God. He was, he was training against idolatry. The tithe is a training against greed. It's your way of defeating greed. And that's why you can't do it only once. Is this our goal, yeah? Yeah, okay. The Lord just asked me to call your name. I don't know why. Okay, but... Um, <laughs> all right, so... Uh, yeah, so... It is, I ask to be recurrent and consistent because it is a training you are doing every, to yourself to defeat greed. Because greed can creep back into you. So you, as you continually tithe, you are defeating greed continually. Every two weeks or monthly for some of you, you are defeating greed. You are telling that greed that you will not rise up in me. No, I defeat you. So it's a training in against idolatry. Hallelujah. This is crazy. I can't believe that. The call for my phone is ringing. All right, then, um, the, set, the third secret was what? The secret of establishing altars. Hmm. So we, we saw in last session that altars establish God's promises on the earth. And they are also a system for perpetuating uh, patterns. If you want some, to continue to have consistent results, our patriarch Abraham understood that, God, you promised me this land for my children and my children's children. But what, I'm not going to be here forever. What if, when I die, how are they going to know? How is this promise going to really move from me to them, to them, to them, to them? He built an altar, a system to perpetuate the promise of God, to penere, realize, how does the word you say? How do you call that word again? Pene, pene, perennialize, perennial. How do you make something perennial? How do you make it last for eternity. So, so altars are a system for perennializing. <laughs> I'm not English is not my first language. If I had to say it in my native language, you'll be amazed. Okay? So, sorry for those of you loving my English. English is not my first language. I speak three languages, by the way. Okay. All right. Okay. You somebody say, Pastor, that's pride. Stop that. Okay. That's true. It's true. What you said. Okay, so what is the definition of an altar? We saw what is the definition of an altar. Altars are either, is either an, an altar is either a material or a material platform or a system that authorizes, powers, or oversees the continuity of parents. Those parents could be demonic or uh, divine. We saw that last week. And we also knew how does an altar, how do we know that is an altar operating in the life of someone. You know that an altar can be operating in the life of someone, in the life of a family, in the life of a church, in the life of a nation. 
altars. How do we know that an altar is in operation? When we see consistent patterns, isn't it? When we see consistent patterns, some things, some results that are consistent over time, there's a strong probability that an altar is in operation. Now, let's recall the five essential ingredients of building an altar. And now, what I'm doing now is actually I'm bringing us up to speed because I realize that some of you, like uh, my friend Austin, actually, Pastor Austin, Austin, I'm going to talk to you about him later. The great man of God from Nigeria sitting right there beside his lovely wife. Uh, he wasn't here for, for the past session, so I'm bringing some of you up to speed. You know, we started seeing how Abraham built that altar, and there were five essential ingredients in that altar. Can we go in, number, in order? Can we name them? The first essential ingredient was repentance, genuine repentance from sin. In our time today, let me contextualize it. In our time today is when you when you repent from sin, it means that you become born again. The day you give your life to Christ, the day you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you repented from sin. So, our congratulations. So, how many of you have already repented from your sin? Hallelujah. From the fundamental sin that causes all the other sins. I'm not saying that you do not sin again. No. We are saints who, who can still sin. We are saints. God calls us saints. It means people who are pure and holy to him because of what Jesus did. But we are saints that can still sin <laughs> and are still sinning. That's why he says if any man has sinned, let them confess their sins and God will be faithful and just to forgive them, right? Isn't it? So when you have already forgive, uh, been forgiven of that fundamental sin, that is the first element of building your altar of financial exploit. Repentance from sin. Because some negative patterns are usually powered by sin. Ingredient number two. God's word in our heart. We saw it in Abraham's altar that he had a knife. Abraham had a knife. And what was that knife was supposed to be? I showed you from, by the intelligence of scripture from Hebrews chapter uh, 4 verse 16, I believe. Uh, he says that... Um, you know, I'm not going to go there. So I'm teaching, I'm, if I go do that, I'm going to preach another message. So the knife symbolizes God's word because it is a two-edged sword. A two-edged sword. The word knife in that scripture, we're talking about the sword. And the sword refers to the word of God. So the word of God in your heart is the second ingredient of your altar. How many ingredients do you have now? Sorry, I've just double checked it. Two. Okay. One of them is that you are saved. You are a born-again Christian. Number two, you have the word of God like what you're doing. And coming to Bible studies. Number three. Let's see. Number three. What is the number three? The second, the third secret. God's spirit. That was the fire. The fire. The fire that Abraham lit. The fire there symbolizes God's presence. And the Holy Spirit directing your life. And you all who have been born again have received the first deposit of the Holy Spirit. It's called the Apache. It is actually the first installment. It is actually the security deposit. <laughs> it's a security deposit of God's presence in your life, waiting for the day you are totally taken. Hallelujah. So you already have the Holy Spirit in you, and that Holy Spirit is enough to guide your personal life. But it might not be enough for you to do works of ministry. Hallelujah. And that's a different message. Let me stop there for now. So you already have the presence of the Holy Spirit directing your life. Congratulations. You have three ingredients so far, isn't it? Ingredient number four. We notice that in Abraham's altar, there was wood on the altar. And we show you that from 2 Timothy chapter 3, in scripture, in the New Testament, sorry, uh, it says that in a great house, there are many vessels and that, 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 If a man is, you know, he shall be prepared unto every good works. So we know that uh, the wood there symbolizes your service to God. The wood there symbolizes your service to God. And each one of us is called to serve Please, and I'm thankful for the team for 2023. In 2023, God helped us to understand our sonship of God so that I've seen so many people serving. So many. I see the young people serving. Like, they serve a lot inside this church. They are so enthusiastic and energetic. Hallelujah. And you all are serving. Maybe it's a challenge for someone. 
you've had all these things, you're born again, you have the word of God, you come into church, you, you have the first deposit of the Holy Spirit in you, but are you serving? What are you, what are you doing in the house of God? Because all of us need to be doing something. Don't you see it's too heavy for a few people? Do you love Tony Jr.? Now, if you love him, do you want his marriage to crash? Because if he's running around and doing all ten things, what do you think is going to happen to his life? Please, let's help. Let's help. All hands on board. Okay? Number five. Ingredient number five. <laughs> this is the thing now. So, the boy, the little boy, Isaac, said, Dad. The dad, Abraham, said, Yes, son. He said, I see the wood. And I see the fire. But, but where is the sheep for the sacrifice? Where is the sheep for the sacrifice? So, and we saw that God showed him the ram. Isaac was put as a sacrifice or the burnt offering. But God stopped Abraham from doing that. And a ram was placed on the altar. And he was burned completely. And it was the burnt offering, the sacrifice that went up to God. And that's where we are coming to today's uh, session. So I brought you up to speed right now. It took me 20 minutes to bring you up to speed. Can you believe that? And if I did not do that, I would have already gone 20 minutes into my sermon. So please, um, I don't know. Please go. <laughs> it's not your fault. None of you, it's none of your fault. But I think it's just better when you keep listening to these things. Okay, so where are we today? We want to understand our focus is on the sacrifice of the burnt offering. What is it really? And I'm going to skip how many scriptures? Three. Media, just be, be aware that the plan was to show us that that sacrifice of the burnt offering was on Noah's altar. The first ever altar that was built in the Bible in Genesis chapter 8, eight verse 20. There was a sacrifice of a burnt offering on it. I'm skipping that scripture. Go do your homework if you care. Then the second, we also find that David was another man who built an altar. And David's altar in 2 Samuel chapter, I think, 22, we see that there was also a burnt offering sacrifice. That costed David a lot. In fact, he bragged that I will not offer a sacrifice to God. That cost me nothing. Hallelujah. Then we go now see Abraham's own altar that he had a burnt offering on it. Maybe it's scripture number three that you need to bring. Scripture number three, Abraham's altar. Media, help me. I'm trying to help myself also by going very fast. Okay. Do not lay. I'm talking about Genesis 22, verse 12 to 13. 12 to 13, media. Thank you. Can you read with me so we'll go very fast? Don't lay a hand on the boy. The angel said, do not hurt him in any way. For now, I know that you truly fear you truly fear who? God. You have not withheld from me, even your son, your only son. Hmm. So, verification question for you. I'm just checking your honesty. Was there a burnt offering on Abraham's altar? Was there? Okay. How did God respond to the fact that Abraham put Isaac on the altar? Let's continue that scripture. Genesis 22, verse 15 to 18. 15 to 18. Let's see what God... God's response to Abraham for putting Isaac on the altar. Then the angel of the Lord called again to Abraham from heaven. This is what the Lord says. Because you have obeyed me and have not withheld even your son, your only son, I swear by my own name that I will certainly bless you. I will multiply your descendants beyond number. Like the stars in the sky and the sun on the seashore, your descendants will conquer the cities of their enemies. Verse 18. And through your descendants, all the nations of the earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. Check your understanding, number one. Number one. What precisely did Abraham's altar that we just read in Genesis 22, what did it accomplish? So the purpose in this is not for you to really respond, but to think. What precisely did Abraham's altar in Genesis 22 accomplish? It caused God to respond. And God responded by swearing. And since he could not find anybody higher than himself to swear, he swore by himself. 
he swore by himself that he would certainly bless Abraham. Abraham willingly turns over Isaac to God as a burnt offering. And God has a reward all the nations of the world. He says you, your descendants will become all the nations of the world. Small wonder all the major religions, even though Christianity is not a religion, but for the purpose of uh, Wikipedia and Google, all the major religions of the world have traced their ancestry to Abraham. What are you talking about? Judaism? What are you talking about? Islam or Christianity, which is not really a religion. Well, religion for some people, not for us. All the nations of the world will be traced to Abraham for putting on the altar his only son. His only son. One and only son. All right. So I learned from there that what you are willing to walk away from determines what God will bring to you. I'll give you a second to contemplate and I'll say it again. It is what, from the purpose of my videographers, it is what you are willing to walk away from that determines what God will bring to you. Is that not true? Isn't that a principle we see all day in Abraham? He walked away from Isaac, his one and only son. And what did he get? Did he become, did he end up alone? Did he end up sorrowful, sad man, destroyed? No name person. You know, no names people. People who die in this world without a child. God forbid for any one of you. In the name of Jesus, that you don't have your name to follow you. You can adopt and make the name follow you. Hallelujah. But you see, you see, you see, you see, you see, you see. The problem is that he was willing to walk away from Isaac to inherit the nation. It is what you are willing to walk away from that will determine what God can bring to you. All right. Good. Praise the Lord. You see why I said this sermon was going to be long? Because I need to take some things very, very slowly for you. Because we are in a season also at World Mission Christian Fellowship where God is positioning us for global impact. And he's doing so many things that doesn't make sense. And some members of World Mission Christian Fellowship are now MIA. Anybody know what MIA means? Okay. All right. Uh, we, know, we know what is going on in your life, okay? You have all the excuses. It's okay. It's okay. But I'm just letting you know that we're in a season where God is ready to use those who are available, okay? Those who are available to accomplish. He can do with any number of people. In fact, when Gideon called 33,000, God picked, chose only 300 from them. So it's not everybody. It's who wants to be available. God's work will be done. Praise God. His work will always be done. Just happily join the crew. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yeah, just happily join the crew because it's going to be done anyway. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. Probably the most powerful messages I've ever preached. So now, having now confirmed the presence of burnt offerings on the sacrifice of the altar, burnt offerings are sacrifices on the altar that our three great patriarchs, Noah, Abraham, David, they all build altars, significant altars, and we saw a burnt offering on their, on their altars. The question then is, what is a burnt offering? What is a burnt offering? Let's define it. What's a burnt offering? So under the New Testament media, help me. Under this is the definition of a, a, burnt, a burnt offering. Definition of a burnt offering. Under the Old Covenant, a burnt offering is a complete destruction of the animal except for its height in an effort to renew the relationship between a holy God and sinful man. Okay, so the word burnt offering actually means to ascend. Literally like smoke going up. Smoke going up, then God breathes it and he sends a good smelling aroma. So when the animal, so, so this is what is happening in Le Leviticus, which shows us how the traditional burnt offering took place. They, they would take the animal, whether it was a sheep, goat, or bull, and it had to be male, it had to have no defect. Then they would take it in front of the tabernacle, in front of the tabernacle, like, like the temple, consider the tabernacle like not just a whole sanctuary, but maybe just this section here. 
they would take it outside, then they would slaughter the animal. They would drain out all his blood. Then the priest would take the blood and sprinkle it on the temple as a means of atoning for the sins of the people. Then they would, they would cut that animal into pieces. Then the priest's job the whole night was to put one piece on the fire on the altar. It will burn completely. Then the smoke is going to God. God is nodding his head. Mm, nice, beautiful. Nice, <laughs> nice. So the priest will picking each piece, is putting on the fire. The whole night, the priest, that was the job, burning all the things. Then here's the thing that happened. They had to remove the skin of the, be of the, of the animal. They have to skin it out. Then that skin, of, and I love that skin part of it. Yeah. If you find it, send it to me, okay? I love it. <laughs> yeah. uh, the skin part was given to the priest as their own reward for that service that they are conducting. God is not a cheater. God doesn't cheat anybody. So that the skin of those animals was given to the priest as their, as their blessing, as their reward for doing that service. So what does that really mean in real terms? So when that animal is slaughtered, because without... The shedding of blood, it is impossible for the forgiveness of sin. It's impossible to forgive sin. So that shed, the animal, the blood of that animal, usually, so I'm going to pass now, and I don't know if I'm losing somebody. People can bring their burnt offering for their sins. So when you bring a burnt offering, an animal for a burnt offering, when they kill that animal and drain his blood and, shed, and, and sprinkle it on the altar, it's like your blood, you have died in the place of that animal. And your blood now on the altar pronounces forgiveness for your sin. You see that? So people were doing it, and the church, the priest do, did it also for the nation, sometimes once in a year. I'm just taking a, fa a, tra a fast course through these things without going deeply into it, okay? So what's the correlation between that and today? Actually, the real burnt offering is Jesus Christ, actually. It's Jesus Christ who became the perfect lamb, because all those other lambs, go look for a goat that is, is not, has any blemish and this and that. The, none of them was actually would ever cleanse the sins of people once and for all. So the perfect lamb was Jesus Christ who did not sin. He didn't inherit Adam's sin. He was not born of the lineage of Adam. He came into the world from heaven. Hallelujah. But he was a man because he went through a woman's womb, isn't it? So Jesus became the perfect sacrifice who's on the cross. His whole body was stone, was put with nails and all of that, similar to killing that animal. On the, then his clothes. Do you know Jesus' clothes? Do you know the people who, who crucified him shared his garment? Does that relate to, to the animal, the skin of the animal that the priest had to take, go eat? So they shared Jesus' garment. So, so Jesus was a perfect lamb, and he was the ultimate burnt sacrifice for all of us that now created an altar of salvation so that anybody, regardless of who you are, where you are, what you have done, and what you've not done, if you can call the name of Jesus, even in Onisha, God will honor that, 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 that. God will honor that, will honor that. Yes, God will honor. Are there some people from Onisha? I don't know where it came from. I, you know. So anyone whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Hallelujah. So it's an altar, you see. Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice on the throne. And his own sacrifice was once and for all. He was not going to repeat it again like the sacrifice that the priest was doing day in, day out. Jesus did the perfect sacrifice for all of us. So... Thank you, Lord, for helping me. I didn't know I was going to explain this in such a uh, very short time, you know. It was like going through a lot to show you this. Hallelujah. So what is it now? What does it really mean? The, the burnt offering in the Old Testament, it symbolized the complete destruction of the animal, right, of sin. The complete destruction of sin in the life of the person who offered the sacrifice. And I bet you to see that when God was asking Abraham, remember that altar in Genesis 22, is God who asked Abraham to go put Isaac on the altar. What was God trying to accomplish there? Sending, is he doing human worship, human sacrifice? What was God trying to do, asking Abraham to put Isaac on the altar? We understand that God did not really want Isaac. He, God did not really want Isaac. It wasn't Isaac that he was wanting. What was he looking for? Thank you. 
apple shape for that. He was looking for Abraham's heart. He was looking really for Abraham's heart. Look here, it was really Abraham who was on the altar. It wasn't Isaac. If Abraham could give Isaac, it means he had accepted himself. He had totally surrendered. God, this one passed me. Now the one this way, you say, um, <laughs> I go here, read my possession. Now the one this, the only one, and if you get another one again, now you say, Ma put them for this. May die. Okay? So, I'm dead. <laughs> That's all. Was he ever going to have another child? <laughs> You just surrender. Finish. All right. Sorry, my online audience and people who didn't understand what I was saying. Sometimes it's beautiful in the local Franca, Franca freak language. Hallelujah. That's called pigeon. I speak pigeon also, by the way. All right. So I submit to you respectfully to today, beloved, that the burnt offering was a request for total submission. A request for total surrender of Abraham to God's plans and purposes. That's inside number one. The burnt offering is a demand for total submission. It's a demand for ultimate surrender. It is proof that we have now been totally, our allegiance and our love for God has been complete. Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul. I live for you alone. When you sing all of that, do you really know what you're talking about? Do you think you really know what you're talking about? Until you be in that position where Abraham did what he did, that's when you can really say that statement and heaven captures it. Say true. There are many things we say that heaven facts checks them and say opinion. Other ones you say, you say fact. Hallelujah. Many of us are singing, but keep singing it. Maybe one day you'll get to the point that it's a fact. Keep singing it. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Okay. So, hmm. so Abraham is teaching us something again about this sacrifice, and God is teaching us something about this burnt offering, that if Isaac has to be on the altar, it definitely means that God is trying to remove some kind of idolatry in Abraham's life. You know, Isaac has come to represent his model of continuity of life, his model for his future, his legacy, and all of that. And Isaac may become an idol in his life, and he has given a commandment, and that commandment is still in the New Testament, that you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. Everything you shall love the Lord of God with all, with all that is in you. But as long as Isaac is still there, Isaac needs to die. Or better still, you need to die. <laughs> Hallelujah. Better still, you need to die. You need to die. And this is the part of the message that is not preaching the churches today. So we need to die to remove idols. Idols, there must be a sacrifice of a burnt offering so that idols are eliminated. They are idols of self. They are idols of materialism. They are idols of things and people. It goes without saying, respectfully, church, that whatever you cannot accept, put as a burnt offering, a sacrifice of a burnt offering, is an idol in your life. I've come to that definition and conclusion. If you don't agree with it now, it's fine. Go pray about it. Go pray about it. Anything that you cannot sacrifice on the altar to God is an idol. If you cannot sacri sacrifice your wealth on, an, on the altar of God as a burnt offering, it means you have the idol of wealth. You're worshiping wealth. Wealth is an idol in your life. If you cannot sacrifice your skill, your talent for the work of God without being paid, that talent is a, an, an idol in your life. You see that? Are you seeing idolatry? Modern day idolatry is anything that you cannot put on the altar of God. God this is a punchline actually. Punchline, good one. You see, anything that you cannot put on the altar as your burnt offering to God is an, is an idol. It's an idol in your life. And how many idol worshippers are here? Is there any? <laughs> okay, progressively will not be. I understand that we are all at different stages, please. As, as I preach this message, I'm very sensitive that we are all, some people just started their Christian work 
about a month ago, about a week ago. So you're not going to get there to doing that. But those of you who have been joining for a long time, and we are all at different levels, different levels, we, will be, we are called to progressively, progressively die to the idols of self, die to the idols of things, die to the systems of this world, and die to even our own plans and purposes. But it's a question of time. I myself, I run away from the calling of the Lord for a long time, for about 10 years. I run away from the call, but I put it all down. I put it all down when the Lord humbled me, and I, I decided to leave it. Hallelujah. I didn't do it out of my own will, by the way. He humbled me, and I accepted that. All right. So, Isaac returned to Abraham and said, Father, Abraham said, my son, what is it again? Is the wood too heavy on your soldier? I think Abraham was asking. Is the wood heavy? Is the firewood that on is on your back? Is it too heavy? Let me help you. No. Isaac said, Father, you don't understand. You don't understand. I see the fire. I see the wood. But where is the sheep for the sacrifice? Where is the sheep for the sacrifice? I see you are born again. I see that you have the deposit of the Holy Spirit in you, which has sealed you to the day of redemption. I see that you are serving in the church. But where is the sacrifice? Am I speaking to some people here? I see that you're born again. So you have repented. I see that you have the word of God in you. You are in church. You are watching online. You have the word. I see that you have the Holy Spirit in you. The deposit that was given to you when you were saved. So you have that. And I see that you're serving in the choir, in the worship ministry, in the tech, in the every department, children's ministry. You're serving. I see you serving. But where is this sacrifice? Without the sacrifice, Isaac knew that the altar would not be complete. The altar would not be built without the sacrifice. Dad, where is the sacrifice? Let's settle this before we get to Mount Moriah. Where is the sacrifice? You see, church... You, can, you are born again, that's great. Congratulations. But it's not enough to build the altar of great financial exploit. Where is the sacrifice? You have the first deposit of the Holy Spirit in you. Fantastic. Congratulations. But where is the sacrifice for the altar? We need to build the altar of great financial prosperity. Where is the sacrifice? I know you are reading the word. You are coming to Bible study. You are doing all of these things. Phenomena. But where is the sacrifice? For the burnt offering. I know you are serving in the ministry. And you are doing a lot. Frankly speaking, you are doing a lot. But where is the sacrifice? the burnt offering. Where is the proof that you have died? Because indeed, the sacrifice is the total surrender. Is the proof that you have died. That's what Paul was saying in, in Galatians 2, 20, my best scripture. No, now, when my people are, com they are compiling future things about me, Galatians 2, 20 is my best scripture. Galatians 2, 20. It's not me who, long, who live anymore, but Christ. That's why some of you are amazed by, the, by the, the amount of strength and energy that I have. Because I'm, I'm dead. This guy, my mother-in-law, Mama, Mama, Julius is dead. It's not him who, is, who you see. The life that you see me living 
is the life of Christ that is working through me. I do no longer live, but Christ lives through me. That's where I draw the strength. That's why I cannot get tired. That's why it's impossible for me to be depressed. It's impossible. Because God cannot be depressed, by the way. For me to be depressed, God has to be depressed. Hallelujah. I thought we got to a key moment in this service already. Even though there's still a lot, I think I've already accomplished what I needed to say to you. We're going to skip several things, okay, immediately. Uh, the message has already been gotten, and God has very strange ways of communicating it. So I'm not more following my, my, my plan. I'm not following my notes, and, uh, but I think I've, he has done what he wanted to do today. Where is the sacrifice? Where is the sacrifice? What are examples of sacrifice? When you have died to your personal ambitions, to your goals, to your desires, and you're only living for Christ. I'll give you two examples, then I end of my personal, because I cannot preach this if I have not experienced it. I told you that uh, how I lived in Cameroon. I was well educated, had a master's degree from a good South African university and came to Cameroon. And not many civil servants. I was a civil servant with master's degree education from South Africa. I came back to Cameroon civil service. Not many had that qualification and track record. But it's not because you have that that you'll be successful. Do you know that? In those countries, right? So they gave me an office with no job. They gave, just put a table there and water was leaking from the roof. And nothing. Nothing to do. But they were paying me. Well, peanuts, by the way. And it wasn't even enough for me to leave. My mother-in-law is here. Thank God you did not die when COVID wanted to strike because you had to come sit here and I make mention of certain things and you are a witness right here and people can go ask you for more information after. I didn't even have the money to rent a decent house. I was living with my wife, three children, adopted daughter in my parent-in-law's home. Am I lying? Was it for one month? Nearly one year. What a, what a shame. In Africa, he married and is living with his in-laws. I was in such a terrible situation that if God doesn't help me, where will I find help? I was a believer on fire for God. And precisely that was my problem because the, the demons of darkness that control those countries don't want people like us. They will do everything to frustrate us. So life was hard. I was looking for international organizations, and I was so qualified. I would put applications; they would not even say, shortlist me. Can you believe it? They are looking for somebody with a, 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 a first degree in economics. I come with a master's, and they still don't shortlist me. Are you kidding me? Day in, day out, that woman was cooking food and giving me. I don't know what was going on in her heart, but I know it was very clear. Nobody made me feel uncomfortable living in that home, in their home for not one month, two months, three months, up to about nine months. So one day, something like a breakthrough came. A friend of mine showed me something. They said, there's a UK consultancy firm who wants to do some market research in Cameroon. And you have a master's degree. Can you do that? I said, sure. After all, in the government work, they was not giving me anything to do. So I can as well take another assignment from somewhere and make some money, isn't it? I signed a good contract with a UK firm. They were going to pay me about a thousand pounds. And if you put it in CFA, in the local currency, that was nearly a million. A million of local currency. A lot of money. That could change my life. I could move out from my parents-in-law's house, rent a decent apartment, and start life. Hallelujah. But immediately, I signed that contract to do that work. It was a four-week job, and I get paid in pounds. The Lord told me immediately when I signed that contract that that would be an offering. That would be a seed. And I didn't argue. I liked it. How did he tell me I was studying the word? And I, I, I heard the voice in my spirit that when you finish that job and they pay you, give it to me totally as a seed. Give it to me. I didn't argue with God. Because I was, even very, I was not even happy with the thing. So if you give me 1,000 pounds, 1, pounds, so what next? Does that solve my problem? Does 1,000 pounds buy me a car? 
<laughs> it didn't solve my problem. So yes, I'm writing, I'm telling you, when what you have is not enough to solve your problem, it's a sin. What, what, when you ha what you have in your hand cannot solve your problem, make it a seed. Hold it at your own detriment, like the farmer who did not plant. When it's time for harvest, nothing. Hold the seed at your, in your hands at your own detriment. It's like the farmer who ate the seed and didn't plant them. Reverend, when time for harvest, they will proudly go to the bush also. What you have in your hand, if it's not enough to solve your problem, it's a seed. I just understood that because I said, what am I going to do with the 1,000 pounds? I calculated it. Okay, if I rent a house, you're going to ask me for 10 months rent. That's already the 1,000 pounds. So what, how am I going to put furniture in the place? I, I need a car. Oh, no, 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 no. It's like the thing was not even a blessing to me. But until I realized that it was a seed, I was working for a seed. So I, 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 I did not argue with God. I knew in my heart that that's what I would do. So immediately, when I finished the, the, the job, and the money came in, my pastor, they paid it to my pastor's bank account, because I didn't even have a bank account. In Africa, it's not easy to get a bank account. You've got to have money before they open you a bank account. So I didn't even have a means to open any bank account that they can wire the money from the UK into my account. But thank God that particular pastor, and I believe he will listen, he listen to me, his, his account, bank account information is what I provided, and they wired the money to his account. I remember it was a Wednesday. Wednesday, we went to his bank. He said he got an alert that they have wired a thousand pounds into his account. Let's go with him. Let me follow him. He drove me in his car. And we went there and he collected the money from Eco Bank in an envelope. All the money in, in local currency. Nearly a million uh, local currency. A million. I have not told him what I was going to do. We, from there we went to church for Wednesday night uh, service. Wednesday start service. During the offering, I just put the same back as I took it from Eco Bank. I put it in the, in the offering basket. I did not even count it, by the way. I, I, they counted it before, before me when they gave it to me. And I took, put it in my back. I just removed it from my back and put it in the offering, offering basket. Then after the service, I didn't even have transport to go home, by the way. So here's the guy. No, poor like a church rat. He just got about a million in local currency and he, just, he, he gave it away. And now I have to go take a taxi, go home. I don't have money. So I crossed the road by faith and stood by where I needed to stop a taxi. I'm looking at these taxis as they are coming, looking as they are coming. Then before I realized, an associate pastor in the church was coming uh, and he honked me. And he asked me, say, can you jump in? I will go drop you at home. I said, okay. He didn't know that I don't even have transport to pay. I'm standing here, just, you know. So I jumped into the car and he went and dropped me at home. When I got home, then the way the real battle started. Because my wife knew that I was going to take the money. So I eat him. And uh, just quickly, I just want to go to bed, okay? I don't want to have any conversation on anything. You know, I just want to go sleep, you know, not, not talk about this. So she came and said, okay, uh, so did you go to the Eco Bank? I said, yes. So you took the money? I said, yes. I'm not saying anything more. And she said, where is it? I said, I put it in the offering. What? I said, that's what I told you now. I myself was angry. <laughs> he said, well, but you, why didn't you just give your 10% your tithe? You gave all of it? I said, well, leave me alone. Okay, this is above me. I turned my bed, my side on the wall, and tried to get some sleep. And just tell the Lord, well, you have to handle this. You are the one who told me to do this. You have to sort that out with her. Of course, she also turned her face the other side and had some sleep. Uh, so we keep going. Then I was thinking that the next day, that I would call me for an interview for some job quickly and things will start changing. Failure upon failure upon failure upon failure. All the applications. One day I remember walking from UNICEF where I thought that uh, they were going to call me for interview. And they... they they were not calling me, so I went to their office, and I didn't even have transport to come back. I went there, and I asked, this application, you people are looking for somebody with a bachelor's degree. I, I, have you done the shortlist or not? Because I have not been contacted. They say, they say, well, we have already contacted the people, and they have done the interview. I said, you mean you didn't even shortlist me? They say, sir, we don't have time for that rubbish. Please, get out of here. I left that office, and I had to walk about 10 miles to get home on foot. 
I took all the track, the, the shortcuts that I knew. Many times I cried to God. I said, how can you be so unjust? How can I do all this sacrifice and you still bring shame? I, can't you see the shame? Can't you see the neighbors are laughing at me? Can't you see my family is laughing at me? What have I done? <laughs> all right, let me show the story. Make it short to end, so that we end the service very well. From that cry that day, when I managed to get home, but before I got home, I started feeling better because I cried. It's good to cry. I cried. I cried loud. I cried. I was frustrated and I cried. And when I cried, there was healing. There was peace. So when I got home, nobody knew that I cried. She never knew this part of the story. So. so when I got home, I ate. Then I got again an email say, hey, Julius, you did that project very well. Do you mind to do another project for us again? I said, sure. So they gave me another one now for 600 pounds. They keep giving it. They keep giving it. They keep giving it. It was never running out. I kept doing it until I got money to carry my family out of, Cam out of Cameroon to South Africa. From South Africa, the Lord opened the door. We're here in America. We no, do not pay a dime from South Africa to bring us into the U.S., you need to hear this. It was on a red carpet. Everything paid for all of us. They even paid to move our furniture from South Africa to the U.S. I said, why am I carrying furniture to, from South Africa to go to the U.S.? It's, excuse me. I'm, I don't have any furniture. They hired a, a, so a, 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 a hospitality person who received us at the airport with their boss, carried us to a home well furnished for us, and was the one going doing groceries for me for one month. You don't want to tell me that. This is the kind of God. I tell you. I tell you. And during the pandemic, I buy a house of about a million dollars. During the pandemic. Don't tell me that there's no altar working. Don't tell me. Don't tell me that. Hallelujah. You needed to hear this powerful testimony. Because it's what you are willing to let go that determines what God brings into your life. And when what you have is not enough to meet your need, it becomes a seed. As we go into the fundraising. Don't let Kinsley come and fine-tune you and how do, uh, uh, how, how do blessing put it? Kinsley doesn't need to ginger you to give. He doesn't have to. Let's not do that, please. Do it to the unbelievers. Not to these people inside this. Not to this one to listen to us. You have understood the power of a sacrifice on the altar. When you do that, you don't know what you've built for your life. So that's the end of that particular sermon today. Hallelujah! Praise the Lord. Can we ask our worship team to come lead you in celebration for a moment of worship in tithe and offering so that you can serve God with your tithes and offering. Hallelujah. And those of you online also, you can do the same. God bless.